Dragon's Dogma 2 is releasing on March 22nd. It's a very promising open world ARPG, but especially if you're not familiar with the first Dragon's Dogma, you might not know what to expect, since many of the reasons I'm excited about it are precisely the many ways that it's different from other games you might have played or that it might remind you of. It doesn't matter if you're a newcomer or a veteran to the franchise, I'm going to go over everything you need to know about the game so you know if this will be for you and why I personally think it'll be a huge hit. By the way, I'm Mugthief, I make videos here on YouTube, and if you like this one, hit the like button, it helps it reach more people. We're really close to 18,000 subscribers, so any help would be greatly appreciated. Let's get into it. Dragon's Dogma 2 is the first single-player open-world RPG by Capcom since the original Dragon's Dogma in 2009, and the first one on their brand new shiny RE engine, which powers things like the Resident Evil remakes. And it's the passion project of Hideaki Itsuno and his team. Itsuno is responsible for stuff like Devil May Cry starting at DMC3, as well as Power Stone and the first Dragon's Dogma. And this matters because from what we've seen and what we know of this team, they are real craftsmen. They aren't afraid to have crazy ideas in the name of preserving their vision and delivering on something that feels like it was made by people who care instead of a boardroom of suits deciding on what will maximize profits. And if you don't believe me, just wait until we talk about some of the systems in this game. The world of Dragon's Dogma is heavily inspired by traditional Western fantasy, citing things like Dungeons and Dragons, and I think you can clearly see it in the monsters and designs. Goblins, trolls, griffins, ogres, harpies, minotaurs, the sphinx, whatever this thing is, and of course, dragons. This translates to armor and weaponry, as well as magic and skills, which are all just a tad less fantastical than maybe some of the more Eastern fantasy counterparts, although still on the big and flashy side. And that aesthetic, this more grounded fantasy Western aesthetic, taken to this graphical fidelity in this sort of game by itself, is very exciting. We don't get many super high budget RPGs with this setting, and even less that are action focused. So for me, it's scratching that slight Lord of the Rings itch I get from time to time, as well as my inner D&D nerd. But this is its own universe, and it has some really cool stuff regarding it that sets it apart, from the races to the types of magic, and everything surrounding your character in the game, which you create in a character editor, and no matter how you make them, they will always be the Arisen, which is the chosen one. But the lore ramifications run deep on this one, and that's for another day. But you also create your pawns, which more on that later. The reason I start with the setting is because it gives context to a lot of the mechanics and philosophy that accompanies the game. And some of these things will be a big reason while you'll love the game or not. Now, for as much as I'm excited about Dragon's Dogma 2, and I do think you should be too, there's stuff in this game that won't be to everyone's liking, and we can't really confirm everything until review time is upon us. But here are the important things you should know. This setting translates to almost everything in the game, starting with a traditional party setup. The game is entirely single player, there is no co-op, no multiplayer, but you have a party, and these party members are called pawns. There's some lore stuff about it, and the game takes place between the kingdoms of Vermund and Batal, the former ruled by royal humans, and the latter the home of Beastren, or cat people if you prefer, but in practical terms you should know that they are player created characters that evolve and learn throughout your adventures together and they can be customized. You can also download and share pawns with other players online and they will take their knowledge and personalities with them, including things like offering specific assistance with a quest, offering to guide you to where you should go because maybe in their original world they already finished that quest so they know where to go. This makes me suspect that one of the potential ways for easing out the experience or streamlining it will be by using pawns, but I can't confirm. And I bring this up and use the example of a pawn knowing where to go because normally you won't know where to go. The team at Dragon's Dogma 2 has said that one of the most important parts of the game is travel and making the journey to a destination as important as the destination itself. This means fast travel is not common. You can do it, and from what we know, you can do that using an ox cart, which you can encounter in different places, and they will take you to a very limited number of places and for a fee, or through a very, very expensive and probably very rare item that allows you to fast travel to a major city. And those are also gated and limited. 
This means that you will spend a long amount of time walking to places and dealing with what you encounter along the way and figuring out how to get where you want to go. You will often know things about a quest like general directions or what path to take towards it, but there are no clear waypoints to comfortably guide you to it, and setting out towards it is meant to feel like an adventure, something you should prepare for, knowing many things can happen or go wrong, and it will be a nice long while until you're back at the comfort of a town where resting, purchasing, restocking, and all your traditional management activities are easily accessible. So you better be prepared for what you can encounter, and balance out your backpacks as you pack camping supplies to rest the night, which is when the pitch black darkness and stronger monsters make it even more dangerous than at daytime. This loop is incentivized through other means, like your total max health will always decrease through combat and damage. As much as you can heal, you'll never be at max until you rest, and that camping supplies that you need to rest is heavy, so you can't just take 15 of them on your trip as you set out to solve a quest or reach a new location. And that journey can have twists and turns and surprises much like any other RPG, and you can get distracted by things like many other open world games and end up in places you didn't expect, as different things can happen throughout the world, but honestly, most of it will be combat. Dragon's Dogma was already quite unique, and Dragon's Dogma 2, as far as we know, at least in its feel, is very similar to the first one, but brought up to modern standards. People tend to compare the first one with Dark Souls, but not exactly, and Dragon's Dogma predates Dark Souls, so I'd say it feels more like a faster and more action combat version of Monster Hunter. And while I haven't played the new one yet, from what we've heard, it's a safe bet that this will also translate to Dragon's Dogma 2. It involves a lot of environment usage, things like climbing onto monsters and focusing down specific parts, even if we haven't seen the Manticore yet, but let's be honest, it'll be in the game. From video footage, I think you yourself can tell if this is appealing to you or not. More important are the decisions you make in how you play your character, and this is an action RPG after all. Instead of classes, Dragon's Dogma uses vocations. You have the usual sword and board fighters, archer, dual blade wielding thief, and mage. But from that initial choice of four, you then progress to gain access to both advanced and hybrid vocations. Advanced vocations are what you imagine, a more focused and more advanced version of the archetype you chose, like the warrior, who goes from the fighter's sword and board to dual-handing massive weapons, and the sorcerer, who is a mage but requires a lot more channeling to do more powerful spells. They each have their own customization within them, with the warrior, for example, obtaining a skill later on that allows you to time your button presses with your hits to speed up your otherwise very slow, heavy-hitting swings. Hybrid vocations combine different vocations together, such as the Magic Archer, which combines Mage and Archer to have you conjuring magic elemental arrows and barrages that can home in on enemies, or the Mystic Spearhand, which combines Fighter and Mage for a vocation focused on wielding a dual spear with enhanced mobility and magic. New to Dragon's Dogma 2 is the one, and potentially more, alternative vocations, like the Warfarer, which is a jack of all trades but master of none, which can use any weapon type and a mix of abilities from other vocations, but suffers from lower stats and less skills than any dedicated vocation, requiring creative use of everything in your arsenal to reach the same damage and utility output as others. But that's not all. Since we have the trickster vocation, we don't know how or where you can obtain this vocation, but we do know that it's a hybrid vocation of two unknown vocations, since all of them are represented by colors and this one combines purple and pink. There's plenty of theories around, including that it's a hybrid vocation of two hybrid vocations, and there is, of course, a lot of speculation of how many other unknown vocations exist, be they standard, advanced, hybrid, or alternative in the game. The answer is, we don't know, and that's part of the charm here. But I was very happy with the vocation system in the first game, except with maybe the balance of them, and I trust the team to deliver not only a lot of great vocations, and therefore ways of playing, but to make them all have interesting identities and gameplay systems to make each of them exciting and worth exploring. And remember that although there are vocations exclusive to your character, pawns also have vocations and your party formation is something that matters, and is something that you have control over. Changing your vocation is something that you can always do, but gaining access to new vocations will require vocation masters, which send you on quests to obtain the weapon of that vocation, 
and once complete, you can now switch into it. This unlock method might not be for everything though, it is confirmed to function this way for the advanced vocations, but who knows for the rest or for the secret ones that we don't know about yet. I mean, what about the Warfarer? Do you deliver every weapon type to somebody? I, I personally suspect there will be more stuff out there to unlock certain vocations. So the basics are set. This is a rootin' tootin' open world action RPG, dark fantasy, plenty of good combat, class diversity, dangerous and grounded world with heavy emphasis on journeying and exploration. This is all reinforced with more emergent gameplay systems. Things like how elements interact or using the environment to your advantage with things like the trickster vocation being very centered on buffing your party, but also tricking enemies into throwing themselves off cliffs or into spikes. To me, the painting that this combination of systems creates is one where each journey is meant to have a sense of anticipation, leading to very organic and memorable not only moments, but entire trips. There is some hesitation to be had here though, even on my part. I personally love games without map markers that strongly encourage you to explore, but they need plenty of cool stuff to find to keep that exploration engaging. Dragon's Dogma 1 didn't stand out for this, but it was 15 years ago, and it's a game that, by the own developer's admission, was woefully short on content compared to what was originally designed for it. We haven't seen how the team will populate this world with interesting quests, locations, and encounters to make that long, slightly lost, but wonder-filled exploration hold up nor what other games they're taking inspiration from for that open world design. It's also just in general something that's not for everyone. The systems present in Dragon's Dogma 2 seem very deliberate and to a certain extent very punishing. These long treks can end in disaster for one reason or another, and while as far as we know there will be difficulty options, this sort of system looks like, or at least to me, one where you can find yourself not only without clear guidance on what to do next, but you will be repeating long treks throughout the world if something goes wrong on your expedition. Heck, maybe repeating those trips and possibly the same exact ones is something that happens even when they go right, and that repetition could be worrying if fast travel isn't something that's more commonly accessible later in the game, for example. These are all things that I'm excited to explore, but if you've ever felt frustrated by repeating large amounts of a modern game when failing, maybe think of something like the Soul series, and if you dislike not having clear directions, something like Tears of the Kingdom, I'd suggest you temper expectations and wait for reviews that confirm exactly how much or how little of those elements are in Dragon's Dogma 2. Something for me very important to shout out though is that for as much as you cannot like some of these systems, there is something that is promised here or that I think is going to be here that I have wanted for a long time now, and that is the real sense of discovery in a game, of finding something hidden, of jumping in on launch day before all of the guides and all of the people start spoiling all of the secrets and cool stuff and just immersing myself into a world and discovering cool things with a community and seeing new posts pop up and new videos and people talking about all the cool stuff they find. It's one of the reasons I think this game will be an important thing to play on launch day compared to other games where it's not that big of an impact. That doesn't mean I think you should just rush into this and pre-order it. I think you should make sensible decisions. And we'll talk more about what you should do if you're on the fence with this game towards the end of the video. But I wanted to shout that out because I'm excited for that. There are further details that we can glean a lot of information from with things like the Sphinx, a hidden optional side quest that requires you to solve riddles in exchange for rewards. But failing the riddle will lock you out. Since the game is confirmed to only have one save slot and it auto saves, this is a chance to screw up for your entire playthrough. And this is another thing I know some people might not like. I personally enjoy it, since to me it's a sign of commitment to this fantasy vision and of something I love in open world games, which is the ability to miss content. Developers normally don't want to make cool stuff that players can miss, since it's usually considered a quote-unquote waste of resources in development. But I'm a huge proponent that when games have content that only some people will see, it organically creates mystery, intrigue, and excitement that at any corner you might find something that nobody or very few people have seen before. Think of things like the sheer amount of dialogue and quest resolutions in Baldur's Gate 3, or Elden Ring and well, just a lot of Dark Souls with its hidden areas, or large open world games or MMOs littered with secrets. The feeling of stumbling onto a massive, beautiful dungeon 
and knowing that it was hidden and many people might never see it, to me, makes players feel rewarded and hooked on a game, making each new step exciting. So I hope that this is something that's present beyond just the Sphinx, but who knows? The Sphinx could lock you out of the quest for failing, but there might be other ways to get the rewards. I personally suspect that if you fail the riddles, later on you can tackle the Sphinx as a boss fight and still get the rewards, but hey, I could be wrong. Anyways, we don't know exactly how much of the total game might follow this philosophy, so if you like this idea, you'll be happy since it seems to trend in that direction, and if you don't, well once again, wait for reviews or more coverage on it. I do want to add something regarding frame rates here. It's been confirmed that it runs uncapped on consoles, which isn't great news. Much preferable would be options for 60 FPS locked in performance mode, and a locked 30 mode as well for higher graphic fidelity. But uncapped frame rates in games like these tend to make gameplay feel stuttery and awkward if the changes in frame rate are too wild. Hopefully we get a better sense of how the game runs technically as we approach launch. I expect it to do very well on PC, since most RE Engine games do, but being the first time the engine runs an open world game, we might have some negative surprises. If anything comes up, I'll make sure to cover it, if not in a full video, at least in a community post or a short. What Dragon's Dogma 2 promises is something that I'm very much excited for. A dark, grounded fantasy setting with a real sense of adventure that doesn't hold your hand. For as many concerns as I have about repetition and travel or the design of the open world, I'm expecting Dragon's Dogma 2 to be an overall great game, maybe even game of the year material. But I'm also expecting it to be a bit divisive. I know I'll find a lot to love in this game, and I'm very excited to dive into the world of the game and explore the kingdoms of Vermund and Batal, and experiment with builds, find cool locations and gear, and truly get absorbed into a game in a way I haven't in a while. Like I mentioned before, I think that this is a game that's going to benefit greatly from jumping in at launch, but you shouldn't feel pressured to do so. If some of the things regarding this game don't sound like something you want to experience, you want to wait and see, I also want to remind you that Capcom normally releases DLC for their games, sometimes big, sometimes small, but they normally drop the price of their games once that DLC comes out and they eventually bundle it in a game of the year edition and that might be a great time for you to jump in later on depending on if you're not sure or if you're short on money that month. $70 is a lot of money to spend on a game that you're not sure on. As much as I'm hyped for it, my two goals with this channel have always been to dissect games and talk about them with the passion that I have for them and hopefully have that be infectious and two to make sure that I inform you guys, that I inform consumers about the good and the bad, I want everybody to enjoy as many games as possible, but that doesn't mean I want you to waste your money. I will continue to cover Dragon's Dogma 2. I have a video coming up on the lore of Dragon's Dogma 1 to get you caught up for Dragon's Dogma 2, and of course I will have impressions of the game as soon as humanly possible. I'll be playing it at launch with all of you, but I will be doing as much as I can to make sure I can inform as many people as quickly as possible. That's kind of the nature of the internet, you want to get out in front of things as quickly as you can. And I will be making an in-depth analysis of it no matter what later on. If you like what I'm doing and you like the videos I make, consider subscribing to the channel. Consider hitting the like button so this video reaches more people. If you're not sure, you can check out other videos on the channel. I think they're pretty good. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you very soon.